Okay, I don't know if the audible is working here, if you can even hear it. Uh, I'm with Marge Winsky. She invited me for a arcade party at the Lighthouse, Montauk Point Light Station. And uh, if I can keep the camera steady here, we're going to look at the storm surge. I haven't used this camera in a while, so bear with me. And uh, I can see the lens is getting all wet already, so I'll be back in a second. Okay, hopefully I'm recording again. I'm trying to keep this lens dry if I can. There's the 1838 keeper's dwelling and the garden being demolished. What's the date? 28th of August, 2011. Almost 20 years to the day of Hurricane Bob. And um, we were up here during Hurricane Bob watching the whole storm and this looks to be pretty similar maybe not as much on the wind there's a shot right down to turtle cove the wave action turtle cove and out to the point keep it here for a second sorry about the the unsteadiness that's the wind watch that meter working inside 68 Steady 68 mile an hour wind, a little bit below hurricane force. Uh, I'll, I'll get my tripod a little bit later and I'll do a better job of keeping this going. But I'm gonna, it's high tide right now, and I'm gonna go around and do a uh, an inspection on the on, on the uh, erosion control protection that's here, watch it, see how it's working, and uh, just you know, live and learn. Wave action, the waves are assaulting the toe of the bluff over there. And uh, that's where the, the, the mass erosion starts because if you lose the toe and it gets eroded, then the, uh, the sediment above it, gravity prevails and uh, it just comes right on down. So then you end up with a pretty steep bluff, but that's the untouched, that's the untouched shoreline of the Montauk Moorland over there. And uh, right now you can see the the wave action pummeling the toe. I'm under 200 pounds. I go out there, I get moved by the wind. Um, I feel safe up here because there's only one projectile that's the black hole. And that's made it through every other event. Whoa. So, uh, I feel okay. I'm certainly not going to leave here and get in a car because it's brutal. The transmission line, the trees, the potential for uh, an unhealthy situation is there. So I made my decision to come here, so I'm staying put. State Park is closed. Um, they made that decision yesterday. There's the parking lot empty. The concession stands to the north of the lighthouse. And then the wave action on the north side, there's the North Park. Okay, we're up. Uh, I think I'm running right now. I got this uh, unit here on a tripod, so it's going to be more tolerable for your eyes. Uh, I'm with uh, my host, Marge Winsky, who lives at the lighthouse and uh, is the lighthouse keeper. So she invited me up, and as always, I, I always come up to try to film the storms, understand what uh, category one, two, three, four, or five mean to this site. And uh, so we're here sitting in the entrance, the vestibule, as it were, at the lighthouse in the 1860 building. The wind is fierce out of the southeast right now. Maybe you can see the, the rain bands passing by vertical, I mean horizontal. And uh, so the vestibule faces west, so we're actually in a very, very secure, safe spot and a good vantage point to, uh, to look at this storm. There's turtle cove and uh, we're on the top of turtle plateau looking down on turtle cove and uh, out there is the point at turtle cove and the waves seem to be about 15 feet or so um, it's around high tide right now so you can see as that wave action and i'll zoom in there a little bit as that wave action hits that toe of that bluff over there that's where 
the erosion process starts. And it's not all the time that these storms come up, once every five years, once every 10 years, maybe two times a year. Who knows, that's all arbitrary, but um, they certainly do take their toll on the beaches and the, and the bluffs of Montauk, there's no doubt. And uh, I'll pan over here to the 1838 Lighthouse Keepers dwelling. Let me get the pan on that. And the garden, which is being blown to smithereens as we speak, although I do see some color down there. And uh, we'll pan also to the north, past the flagpole. That's our only projectile that could hurt us at Montauk Point. There's the state concession. The whole state park is closed. Not a car in the parking lot. I snuck in illegally. And of course, Marge has all the uh, credits that she needs to hang out. Here. She, she owns Montauk Point. But uh, the winds, uh, uh, top winds thus far off our meter inside the building and up top of the lighthouse was 88 miles an hour. And uh, the last time we checked it was uh, 68. So gust of 88, sustained wind 68. We're gonna go back to the cove and get a little closer and check out that, that wave action up against the toe of the bluff. trouble with my batteries here so I don't know if I'm gonna be able to uh, go on the eastern slope and film it but I was out there earlier just to try to see what the high tide is gonna offer on our uh, on our erosion control protection and uh, the, high, the high tide uh, the water was coming up over the 18 foot bench on the on the on the protection so um, we're getting wave run up above 18 feet above sea level and if I can get the camera working, boy, what a vantage point it is. It's on, sitting in the middle of Georgia, how ironic, sitting in the middle of Georgina Reed's terrace situation where she first started in 1970. Sitting down on a stable bluff, hiding behind a pine tree. I just hope the camera and the battery uh, works because I'd like to share that with you, hopefully. But we got a good vantage point right here as well. And uh, I'm going to pan out to the sea out over there. And... Uh, little too fast you know the waves are clearly breaking you know a quarter mile plus out there and there is a hell of a lot of water moving around Long Island right now and as this storm uh, goes inland those counterclockwise winds uh, when you are gonna pan over to the north side Watch if I didn't hold this camera, it would blow right through the through the door here. If you go over to the north side, that water over there is going to start moving real soon, and it's not going to stop until late afternoon today. So, any of the bays and shelters and coves and marinas and, ha and homes on the north side of uh, uh, of this peninsula, they're going to have a hard time today, no doubt about it. Downtown Montauk, another issue. I'm staying far away from that. The police won't even let you near the beach, so they're they, they've got their their their, uh, their systems going just right. No one's gonna no one's gonna get hurt, and no responder's gonna have to go out and risk his life to save someone. So um, they've got to look at the water just going over the bluff over there, overwashing probably elevation eight or nine feet. Above sea level and the water is just going right over the top of it. Let's show that little. Uh, I got a phone call, so I'm, oh, I'm just going to leave this on. Any up? Down to 58. There's no doubt that we're going to be spared here on this storm. Um, you've got to take into consideration a Category 1 at the, at the wrong tide, which is a high tide, you know, with all the moon alignment and everything else. Category 1 can be pretty vicious. But this storm is showing signs of backing off hurricane strength. And uh, now it says 58. 
steady winds on the meter at the lighthouse. Usually when it gets up to around 100, the meter craps out, and then we, we don't have the advantage ever knowing. But 88 has been the strongest gust so far earlier. And uh, we're going to be lucky with this storm just because it's starting to back off already. It's going to last a while. In contrast, in contrast, Hurricane Bob was through this area in an hour and made its way up to Providence and you know, wreaked havoc up, up in Massachusetts and Connecticut, Rhode Island. But it was moving so fast, it didn't have time to really settle in and do the extra damage that can happen in these storms. This one is going to stay around all day long. Um, and uh, so I expect if it's 10 o'clock now, we're going to be rocking and rolling until at least 3 in the afternoon. And uh, and then tomorrow's supposed to be sunny and beautiful. Go, 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 go figure, huh? <laughs> but uh, we're going to get spared here. There's no doubt about it. We're very, very fortunate. And uh, I just hope my batteries work so I can get you on that east side over there because that's a particularly interesting vantage, vantage point. And then also tomorrow, in the sunshine, with the sunblock on, we'll go be doing uh, some assessments, damage reports or progress reports, I don't really know. Uh, up until now, we've had nothing but progress reports after a storm. No, we've had no, no rock slumping, no extra erosion. So our stabilization project is, is working just fine, but we can always get trumped by Mother Nature quite easily. We're not, we're not in the game to think that the North Atlantic here is, uh, is, is not going to cause problems for us. It will always cause problems for us here at the Lighthouse, and there's no doubt about that. So um, we'll just keep our eye on the protection, and then uh, as time goes by, we'll make the protection as good as we can for the next storm. Marge and I are going to go up to the tower, too. We're going to treat ourselves to that. I was up in the tower with uh, Larry Penny and Hurricane Bob, and uh, it was in the, blown in the 90s, and that was quite interesting. Um, you couldn't hear yourself think, actually. Uh, but nonetheless, it's worth, worth the trip up to just, you know, get an overall view of how the, the ocean and the surge and this, the, the rise and sea level, the wave action, and, and the wave attack on the shoreline. You, you get a real good picture from up top, and we'll be going up there. And uh, you know what? I'll bring this camera up there, too. There's electricity up there, right? There's a plug, plug up there? OK. So maybe we can bring this camera up and sit up there for a little while and just uh, give everybody a special vantage point from the top of the lighthouse in Hurricane Irene. Wish we had the weavers on stage, you know? Good night, Irene.
easily to 18 feet, elevation 18 feet. stable ground. Thank you, Georgina. And uh, we're watching the, the seawall take a constant hit from the wave attack. And uh, the 18 to 20 foot waves, solid 18 foot waves out there, are moving the water in every direction possible. Here you go. Look at this one. Maybe I'll blow away on this one. Who knows?
Thank you all for coming. I'm in good company. And uh, I don't think I have to tell you how special Montauk is, okay? Let's get that right off, okay? I think there's some, something that gets you when you cross that peak and it's done. You're done, okay? And um, this talk about Montauk um, starts about a thousand years ago, or thousands of years ago. Um, in uh, the, the, the glacial history of Long Island and how Long Island was formed and became a terminal moraine um, 20,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago. So um, just imagine at the end of the last ice, ice age, um, a 300-foot wall of ice somewhere close to the shoreline as it stands right now, all right? And what we know about ice, we learned from the Inuits, ice has insulating properties, okay? And that's why they live in igloos, igloos in the Arctic, and they survive, okay? So it's kind of an interesting concept about this, this idea of a 300-foot wall of ice, and down below, there's insulation factors, okay? So the, the big 300-foot uh, uh, wall, 300 wall of ice is just coming down, and it's excavating, and it's crushing, and it's digging, and it's boom, boom. It's doing all this thing as time goes by, and then it reaches to the point where, by the way, uh, they don't retreat. Glaciers don't retreat. They meet up with different climate, and that's what gets them to retreat, gets them to go back. So it's kind of an oxymoron right there. But glaciers, if it's, if it's cold enough, they go over and cover the whole globe. OK, that's all there is to it. As soon as the weather comes up in temperature, the glaciers melt. OK, but same with the compression of this big thing. So you can imagine, you know, so Lake Ronkonkoma gets dug out. You know, the Carmen River Basin gets dug out. Connecticut River gets dug out, as well as Fort Pond, Hidden Lake, Lake Montauk, Oyster Pond. And then as the glacier retreats, all that meltwater goes into all those deficits, and you have it right there. So the Ronkonka moraine, moraine comes from Lake M Ronkonkoma and goes right out to Montauk Point. There's another moraine above that. Uh, but um, it's fascinating to think that um, through all that uh, geologic history comes Long Island as we know it. So fast forward to the colonial days. Those freshwater ponds are very significant. Colonists all over in New England are having a hard time getting economies going because the world ain't easy, okay? And it ain't easy for survival, and it ain't easy for mankind socially to get the mojo going so that things can be comfortable for everybody. So what it comes down to is um, the colonists in East Hampton, the bubbies, the locals, they had a jump start on economy, and I'll use the economy, the word economy, three times in this talk. They had a jump start on economy because of what Montauk is, what Montauk was, excuse me. Montauk was nothing but those glacial freshwater ponds and maritime grasses. They could bring their herds on to Montauk every year, fatten them up, and get the dough bucks for it. So they had a jump start on the economy. Colonists all over New England would have loved to have maritime grasses and freshwater like these lucky people in East Hampton did, all right? So the, the fact that um, uh, the pasture system, as we know it, you know, developed the economy around here. And uh, it should not be forgotten that Montauk made the East Hampton community very, very rich with maritime grasses and fresh water. It's fascinating, OK? Later on, the trees came, and then it changed landscape-wise. But initially, that was the jewel of this local area. Montauk was the jewel because it could give them the money they need to make a strong community, okay? So, 1792, the second time I used the word economy. Little known fact, it's the, it's the, the business people in the Chamber of Commerce in New York City that petition President Washington in Philadelphia. If you don't get ships to port, our economy is going to sputter. You get ships to port, we're going to have our mojo working, and we're going to do something here. Washington right away got the second act of Congress and bought the land from the proprietors. The Indians have been gone, for, the natives have been gone, Montauk has been gone for a while. Uh, the British took over, pushed them out, and, and then there was all kinds of wars back and forth. But, you know, that's the way it was. Um, the Chamber of Commerce said build it. 1792, the funds were appropriated. 1796 is when the lighthouse is built from stand, sandstone across the, uh, the, the sound, barged over, horse and buggy to the top of the building. Construction starts in April, finishes in October. 
the proprietors had one little thing to say. They didn't like the idea the lighthouse was coming local. They had an industry in salvage, okay? So when there's a shipwreck, the locals are down there whew, reeling it in, all right? And that was a big part. Once again, economy is difficult. You'll take it by any means, okay? So ship gets wrecked. That stuff is yours, and that's money, money in the bank. So it's kind of interesting that proprietors actually got the last laugh because the federal government is bigger than the locals. And they get the last laugh because the whale oil boat in 1796 ran aground in Amagansett. They stole and stole, oh, no, excuse me, they gathered the salvage and sold it back to the federal government, and it wasn't lit till the spring of 1790, uh, 1798, 1797, excuse me. So you have a little, uh, a little comedy relief going on, but the proprietors got their last say, but then the lighthouse is now 222 years old, and it's a, it's a symbol of America. Um, if you want to get a little uh, dreamy in, in, in the history, just imagine, you know, immigration is a real tough item to talk about in this day and age, okay? And it was back then, but immigration flowed into America. It flowed, it flowed. So you can imagine uh, a, a woman and a husband with a son leaving with the fear of no money, no language, no shelter. What am I going to do? And they're five or six days at sea, and they're going to Ellis Island. They know it. They don't know what the hell is going to go on. But then all of a sudden, something gets onto them, and they can't sleep, and they're on the deck of that ship coming around Montauk Point, and that boom, that beam of light zaps them. That's the first thing they see in their new country. Really cool idea, really nice idea. So for the next 100 to 150 years, there ain't nothing going on in Montauk except historic architecture, Montauk Point Lighthouse, and the Seven Sisters, the Stanford White Houses, okay? The rest of it is just maritime grasses, fresh water, and nada. No fishing industry, no tourism, just simple herds in the summertime, okay? So um, the first thing, the fir actually, let's give credit right here to the first erosion control concept. This is the landmass. They put the lighthouse on the land side of Turtle Plateau. When they built it, there was 300 feet of land. This is, 17, uh, this is 1878. There's about 200 feet of land. They predicted, the geologists and the, and the architects predicted that the recession rate was about a foot a year. In 200 years, there was 200 feet lost. So they're right on the dime academically about what's going on. So I give credit to the early planners first, because if they didn't put the lighthouse here, we wouldn't be talking about the lighthouse. We wouldn't have it as our iconic uh, local symbol. The Indians would make fires to communicate with the, the Indians across the way, OK? and they would make fires right on the edge here. First thing that's done proper in the erosion control specter is to set the building where it is. Way to go, guys. Gave us 150 years. The second thing that happens is post-World War II, there's a lot of testosterone, there's a lot of machines, there's a lot of US Army, has Corps of Engineers, has a lot of stuff going on. So they build an 840-foot seawall with 15-ton stones. They did a really good job. but no modern day acrylic fabrics behind the construction. So in the 1950s, between 50 and 4, in the East End, we had three hurricanes that clocked us. Hurricane Carol in 54 being uh, memorable. And so the wave attack would come in and hit the bank. It would make milkshake out of the sediment, and the rocks would fall. So it was a failed experiment. However, if you've been to Montauk Point recently, um, those stones are still visible. In a, in a necklace around Montauk Point. And they served the Coast Guard in the early 90s as a way to get this revetment and this protection against wave attack going. So there's the first physical, tangible erosion control effort at Montauk Point. You notice there ain't no vegetation. This erosion control thing of bluff stabilization in the North Atlantic is all about three things, protecting waves, protecting against wave attack, the vegetation of the bluff face, and then you have underground streams of groundwater seepage that are insidious. They, they just never stop, 365 days a year, 24-7. They, they weaken the terminal edge of the sediment here, and that's where erosion is a little bit faster, okay? So three things have to happen. No one knows that, okay? And so, 46, the lighthouse is on its own. There ain't no money coming back to it because there ain't no comprehensive plan. 
until 1967, the Coast Guard, because of the Vietnam War, expenditures that they didn't want any part of, they want nothing to do with historic preservation, they want nothing to do with erosion control, they're for search and rescue. We can put a steel tower right back down here in the parking lot and get by, let them keep the mariners safe. And they were, they were principally, they were off and running that, okay? They were going to board the lighthouse up in 67. Enter Dan Retina. Dan has always these foo-foo contests left and right all over. They're quite interesting and they're quite foolish. But they get you. His, his publication gets you, okay? And he's got a sense of humor to boot. So he stages the first Montauk Point Lighthouse light-in on a rainy August day in 1967. Unheard of. People dropped what they were doing and came to the lighthouse for a candlelight vigil to save the lighthouse. Coast Guard wouldn't even let them on the property. So they had it right outside the gate. Enter four foot ten in high heel sneakers, Georgina Reed, living in Jackson Heights, okay? Textile designer, author of a successful book on photography. Not a coastal anything. As the story goes, in 62, if you know your storms, you have the 38 hurricane, the Easter Sunday nor'easter of 62, and Sandy. Those are the three prevalent top-level storms that we've had in the last 80, 90 years. So 62 comes by, and Georgina has her dream house in Rocky Point. It's a 100-foot sand embankment, nothing like the glacial till that exists here. This is compacted by the glacier. This stuff is actually quite resistant toward erosion because of the compaction and the clay and, and the cobbles and the boulders that are in there. Um, if you take a ride on the ferry across the Sound and you look at the North Shore of uh, Plum Island, you'll see 100 ton glacial erratics, they're called. All right. And in Montauk, we don't, have, we don't have many hundred tons, but those stones that are locked into the glacier, once again, that big ice-moving thing, taking every rock, boom, boom, and compressing it all, and then when it gets to the shoreline, it gets exposed, and these things drop one after another after another. Next time you're on the ferry, go check out those stones on the north side of Plum Island. They're huge. Um, I was working on the hillside on East Lake Drive, and Pat Bistrian was, was on a site doing the excavation, and there was a 150-ton erratic in the earth that was above the house. And so now here was a modern problem for the contractor. Okay, what are we going to do about it? Bistrian brought in a jackhammer. Didn't work. Try, could move it? No. 150 ton? No way. All right? So the thing's sitting there. The house is below. So what does Bistrian do? Brilliant guy. He starts digging and digging and digging below elevation. The rock falls in the hole. He covers it over. Forgotten about. Okay? <laughs> So the fact that, you know, these 150-ton things are being moved and moved and moved, and now the thing recedes, and you have some of those, those natural stones in, 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 in the muck here and there. Matter of fact, you look over here to uh, this photograph. This photograph right here is pre-Corps of Engineers at the lighthouse. Look at that beach right there, all those cobbles I'm talking about, that array of stones, some great stuff. So this is a failure, and then... Georgina gets Dan Retina's little newspaper. All right, Georgina, right? Boy, oh boy. I knew her well. I worked with her. Um, we, we, we sparred, we battled. But she patented her method and then wrote a book, How to Hold Up a Bank. What do you say about that? All right? Um, she had it. And more so than anything, more than the engineers that helped me out today with this project, she was a soil economist on that bluff face. It's real difficult to start doing terraces, and then all of a sudden you get into a deficit of soil. She would know how to start a project. She would start a project in the middle and start her terraces, all because she knew that the soil economy, she was going to need that soil here or there to fill these terraces. And I just stood back and looked. I said, no one knows this about this girl, but she's quite a wizard. Uh, she's more than an engineer, but she's not an engineer. So that's where Georgina comes in, CCOM. 1000 bucks down, 1970. I'm sure the Coast Guard engineers had a lunchroom chuckle that day when this girl came in and said, I can do that. Because this is what she was looking at. That's where she started, right here. So the Coast Guard looked at her and said, yeah, maybe, yada, yada, yada. But because it wasn't coming out of their pocket, they gave it to the, the concerned citizens. Georgina's board terrace, tongue and groove cedar. Her support stakes, untreated spruce pickets. And she starts on the bluff face. And then she takes some perennial ryegrass and puts it in her terraces. Boom, boom, boom. And lo and behold, 
She greens the embankment the first summer up to an elevation. Wow. Concerned citizens are psyched. Coast Guard's curious. More money from the concerned citizens. Two summers, she does a swath all the way up to the top. Digging like a mole and climbing like a goat with all volunteers. How about that one? One time, the, the commandant of the Coast Guard said, go down and help Miss Reed. She needs your help. He had a size 22 foot. Her terraces were only like this. The poor guy comes down to help, and she says, she says, the first expletive she ever used in her life, get the out of here. <laughs> yeah, but my boss, no, go do something else. So with the volunteers and the Phragmites reeds, that's where it comes from. Reed Trench Terracing. It's not, she's not an ego. It's not named after her name. It's named after the Phragmites reeds that she used behind the board terrace to keep the sediment from falling out. She discovered that in 1962 when she lost a third of her land during the nor'easter of 62. All right? And what am I going to do? Well, she goes down the beach, and she sees the gully. She sees the Phragmites. She sees the lumber, puts it together, terrace. Ah, patent, book. And she starts doing her own embankment. And she greens her own embankment, not knowing that she was up for this lighthouse thing. But as soon as she read Dan Rettina's thing, she came to the rescue. And under comic relief and a little bit of money here and there, she greened the embankment. It was in the late 70s where some of the plant botanists in, in uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania made a beach grass that adapted to heavier soils called Cape American. And I had gotten that. I gave it to Georgina. And I said, Georgina, look, your terraces ain't going to last long. Put this stuff in. And lo and behold, right now, you can see some of Georgina's board terraces from 1970 still sitting there, because that's never to be seen again. Once again, the arbitrariness of, 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 uh, of the glacial till is that you have impenetrable clay, all right? And it leads up into a segment of just sand and cobbles and goes back to clay. Go figure. Who, who, who made that program? I don't know. But that's how arbitrary this whole movement of glacial, glacial and ice is. It's a really fantastic thing. This is the iron ore right here. And uh, actually, my terraces fit right in. You can even see that. My terraces were part of the art scheme here. That's a joke. Just arbitrary. Little cobbles, big cobbles. Those areas are quite um, fragile, where the, where the stones and the sand are. And then my guys, uh, that's the Cape American, in the steep terrace, without the, without the helmets and without the harnesses. And there you go. We're off and running. Now, the, now the thing about planting Cape American, and I, and, I, and I also put down a little bit of clover as a nitrogen fixer, and I use fescue so it won't take over the Cape American. The thing about it is that those plant tops, when a 100-mile-an-hour storm comes by, those plant tops get obliterated. But they just desiccate and pop right up again tomorrow. All right? It's a great future with Cape American. Not to mention, when fall comes and the shore goldenrod and all the seed pool gets in the air and blows down, those plant tops catch it for the first time, drop right into a, vertical, a horizontal terrace. You should see the goldenrod all over this stuff. I'd like to give myself credit for planting it. I just watched it for the last 25 years. And it's remarkable how the goldenrod, which is as deep-rooted and as successful as the Cape American, is all a volunteer. Beautiful stuff. And now it's all over the bloody place. So there's Georgina's Gavians. All right? And we got some storms coming up here now. You want me to talk about storms, OK? The early 90s. So we have Hurricane Bob, August 19th. 1990, 1991, uh, category one, nothing to write home about. In 20 minutes, it was hitting Providence, all right? Just boom. It was really nothing to really be scared at, about. But it did come in and rattle the Gabians. And you can see those cages get beat up. There's the Corps of Engineers stone out in front. They, the Gabians, the Corps of Engineers gave them some foundation. And the Gabians were Ge Georgina's uh, protection against waves. That was a Coast Guard expenditure. Now, now comes the creme, the creme la creme. 91 again. Two months later. We called it the, ho the, the Halloween No Name Nor'easter. And then Sebastian Junger wrote that beautiful book about the perfect storm, about the low. You know, westerlies take lows and they move them right out of sight. Right? They're gone. Well, there was one low that, way, that stayed. 
and then another low was over here another, and pushed it right down. And a high came in, and that thing came right in. So a low came from way above the Gulf of Maine and came back. And nor'easterns are worse than hurricanes because there's one, two, sometimes three high tide events where you're going to get schnockered, okay? And it's going to be relentless. So there's the result of uh, the perfect storm. The gabions are tattered. We're back to zero. It's not fun. Sometimes, you know, I'm so, it's, like, it's like Wall Street. Now I'm beginning to lose my equity. I'm starting to get, I'm starting to get a little knock-kneed right now, okay? I'm losing my equity. Hello, people, I'm losing my equity. What's happening here? Can the federal government help? All right, this is uh, after. So, so here I am at high tide with all my, uh, with all my uh, you know, I guess the, the chutzpah ran and, and the spirit from Georgina got into my veins. I'm filming at high tide at 6 o'clock. The next high tide is 6 a.m., I'm there at 6 a.m., and the land I was stand, standing on, we lost 30 foot in one night, okay? Over top the Gabians, and that's Bobby Van Velser. Now there's a 30 foot gap, and I'm saying, we're in trouble. We're in trouble until the Coast Guard finally comes along with their 488 and then their 688. And stones are set deliberate. There's a stone setter that knows the shape of the hole, the shape of the stone, and there's a crane operator or an excavator operator that'll place it just like a cotton ball. And uh, they're set kissing on three or four sides, whatever, and uh, some good, good stone setters. 25,000 ton is in that wall. The new wall, incidentally, is 63,900 tons coming our way. This is nice before and after. And, uh, and I'm proud of this one because um, Jamie Walsh, Bruce McCarthy, Mark, X, Mark Edwards, Greg Donio, and Danny Crowley are the crew. I said, I'm going local. Forget it. We're going local. We're going to get everybody from the Shaguan and come out here and <laughs> come out here and, and, and you work under my tutelage and we'll do just fine, okay? And we'll be at the Shaguan for lunch, okay? But no. So I get these hill apes alongside with me and this is what we did. This is post 91, perfect storm. It's a wreck. 30 feet lost in one night. We get the money and we start our mojo working. I worked first on the south side. Um, then the, the feds came in, the Coast Guard came in and did their thing with Rambo. Uh, Firebird was a constructor, Rambo was the, uh, was, was the uh, subcontractor, and those guys were great stone setters. And this is the stuff that the locals did right here. In fact, that wall hasn't shifted anything since 93. And it's in good shape. And we made, Dick White and I were at a meeting in Congressman George Hochbruckner's office. And, um, I said, you know, there's a, a high value of recreation at this place. Can we put a sidewalk or a, a, a walkway in for pedestrians in the state park and for recreation? Yes, we'll call it a bench. It's the most used thing at the lighthouse now. We have thousands of people every year walk that thing, boom, boom, boom. So we put in a bench at elevation 16 to 18, and uh, it was a great component. And uh, it was, the once again, the local hill apes that had that idea. It's funny because the lighthouse represents an incredible, and I'm a cynic as far as government, you can, you can spit me out and put me in the back seat, okay? I just don't like the way it works. I just think it's, it could be run better, being a self-employed businessman. But the civilian government alliance since day one here, starting with Georgina, is something that is very, very special because it's not always the big boys leading the way. It's four foot 10 Georgina. And things get done. Sometimes one step forward, two back. Sometimes three step forward, one back. Not even knowing where it's going. But the combination, the luck quotient, and the combination of good people working on this, and we'll give credit to Monto Historical Society. I'll tell you what, they've been stellar in the trust and the vision and understanding where this is going to go. Because if you have a museum up top and you don't do this first, you're limited in scope. Okay? So the bluff is stabilized. And Georgina is the heroine. The historical society has got a future, but there's one problem. In the Coast Guard effort in the early 90s, it was they didn't have the money to engineer it. So the wall sits with a slope angle like this, 10-ton boulders. And when you know something about hydrodynamics and what water can do, the waves come in and attack. They may jiggle that stone a little bit. But that water's got to go back. 
so it gets jiggled again. Right now, there's a 100-foot section where the lower slope stones, not on my work, but around the corner, are coming apart. And unless we have this new thing that's coming our way, it would be the end of recreation and fishing around the bottom of Montauk Point. We'd have to, we'd have to fence it off and say there's a fallen rock zone, it's too dangerous. In fact, there was a fatality in April, in March. Young man, um, Aaron, uh, uh, his first name was Aaron. He was a shoe chef interviewing at Gurney's. He was a fisherman, loved it. The surfers, surf, surf was up that day, and he took a walk, and he got washed off the wall, and he died. And the surfers were good enough to talk to me and communicate with me. And they said, oh, so-and-so has a picture of him. I said, can you get me that picture? Can you give me the name? I get the picture, and I give it to the kid's mom. I'm in the family right now because it really, really made her feel good and made all of us feel good. But the guy got washed off the wall. So safety right now is a concern. And so it's a, it's a little bit of a race. There's the Rambo. Look how much underlayer stone goes into that area. Right? Look at all that stone, which you can see when wave attack comes in. All right? It hits those big stones, the capstone, and then, gets go and then it's just like a big drain and goes out. Meanwhile, the filter cloth is back over here protecting the sediment. There's the filter cloth right up top. That stuff is sensitive towards sunlight and petroleum projects. So it's got petroleum products. So it's got to be buried. And uh, where it is right now is a good spot for it because it's buried. There's my friend Bruce McCarthy from our era on the north side putting in the filter cloth together. Thank you, Bruce. It's the cheapest component and probably the most important. And there's my group uh, with the excavator. I, I preferred to work with an excavator than a crane. And we're working on the north side right there. That's about a seven tonner coming in the hole. There's the toe, all important toe. That's our foundation. My friend Daniel Crowley walking on the seven, seven tonners, eight tonners. If that doesn't move, then your wall ain't moving. We, we, we spent extra time putting those stones in. Now, storm sequence. There's my friend Daniel. He's not with us anymore. Um, but he was a big part of my team and a good guy. He's probably, his butt's sitting about elevation 19 right now, above sea level. Something like that. So here's the sequence. It's probably the, the nor'easter of 92, as I remember. December, three days, once again. This is all one view. Now the bunker is halfway gone, and now the bunker is nowhere. All right? And that's a little storm. Although the trouble with that, it was three high tides. You get nailed. If you're unprotected, you get nailed. You got to be ready for that. The three high tides, you got to be ready. But I wanted to give you a basis of really what happens. The nor'easter yesterday alarmed me in downtown Montauk. I went to look, and all I saw was uh, I saw a river, a wall of water moving west. A lot of it was not hitting the beach, but the movement of the water was, was outstanding. And here you see a little bit of that. The whole cove is filled up. And uh, there's almost, more, there's almost no, no defense when it, when it wants to do what it wants to do. And then we're finishing up my wall on that side. 25,000 ton delivered, 30, 35 ton at a time. I signed every slip <laughs> for the truckers over the course of five years. Um, never had a truck injured. It's a lot of stone coming off. Sometimes the stone inventory for a stone setter, is, it, it, it gets a little tense because if you don't have a lot of stone, you can't make choices. And uh, sometimes I'd see that truck go up, I'd see the bed go up, and I'd see that rock in the middle. I'd say, that's it, boom, <laughs> go down and get it. Okay, turn it this way, boom, 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 right in the hole. And there's an audible. When a stone is set right, there's an audible. You know that it's, that it's there. But the methods work, by and large. All right? That's pre-Georgina. You can see how the wave attack overtopped the bluff face and separated the 1946 wall from the bluff face. You see the particularly site-specific shoreline of the Montauk moorland, the glacial bluffs. That's a great shot right there. And once again, that slope angle one-to-one, -one, and that's where the loss at sea. Are we controlling erosion? Yes, we are. Matter of fact, we're writing a book on it. Wow. Okay, 25,000 ton of stone later. Sandy hit us where that fence line is. 
This pine tree at this particular point, 20 years later, is about 20 feet tall. It died from salt intrusion. Those two before and afters are significant. And then down on my side, this is my resume. You see the bunker on the beach. You see a fairly respectable slope angle around the corner due east. But then you're getting into a slope angle that's near impossible. A uh, lot of digging and a lot of luck. And there we are. That's today. So we've shown the way to the engineers. I've been working with some of them for 26 years. And we've gotten over one hump after another, the biggest one being this local uh, sponsor thing. That was huge. The feds and the state paying for this. Why not? It's a national historic landmark. I mean, we did run into a bump in the road with surfers. They said, move it. You're going to ruin our break. OK, I'm your friend. You're the, you're the most underrated athletes in the world. Go get your pro boner engineers, and let's sit down and have a, have a talk. No talk, just insistent. Move the lighthouse, move the lighthouse, move the lighthouse. So six years, and Eleanor Earhart is our point person. A salary to Robert Hefner, maybe $50,000, $60,000 over six years. We tried to become a National Historic Landmark many times. Even George Washington's name was not enough. Sorry, that's not enough. What are you talking about, it's not enough? No, sorry. We go this time, and Robert Hefner is, he's got both six guns. He's ready to go. He goes and gets the bills of Leyden from 1797 to 1870 and says, we were put here to help the economy of a growing nation. We get a 9 to 0 unanimous decision, National Historic Landmark, not to be moved. Thank you. OK, conscious and deliberate for us to really find our way here. So the locals find their way. The civilian alliance, the civilian government alliance that was created long ago gets stronger and stronger. They see the need for $24 million. It's in the bank. There's another $1.7 billion for New York State. They have in their vision the idea that this place is worthy. And yes, this place did, in fact, have a lot to do with the growth of a nation. Thank you, Robert Hefner, for bringing it to the fore. Uh, because now we would hope that would work for us with grants. With fundraising, we're trying a whole bunch of things to keep this 222-year-old lighthouse. We, not only do we have to juggle the maintenance of the revetment, we have a 222-year-old lighthouse that we have to come up with money for. So in fact, it's working. And like Simon said to us, I don't know where we're going, but we're on our way. And the MHS is a worthy, worthy owner and collaborator. And the feds and state parks, DEC, have been on this. And I have to say one thing. It occurs to me knowing these people as long as I do, that some of the stuff and the passion that we're about drips off onto these guys. These guys are just doing government contracts, you know? But they show up twice a year in our presence, and we're communicating five times a month. And the more and more they see what we're about and how, how honest and judicious we are with our moving forward here, it kind of gets them, man. It kind of gets them, and they move in, and they, they're, they're like bobbleheads. Just like the octogenarian lady said, yes, I guess we have to take it. Uh, we're, we're, we're Montauk Historical Society after everyone said no. Because when a federal uh, uh, installation is excised, they have to have every person in the federal government, every agency say, do you want it? Say yes or no. And no one, not even the people running the Fire Island Light, said, we don't want anything to do with that. Why? Because of the historic preservation? That belongs to those Montauk people. But the erosion control? No way. It's not possible. Then it goes to the state level. State Parks owns the concession, the parking lot, and two pieces of land on either side. We don't want nothing to do with that, baby. Then it goes to the county level. This is the protocol. And that's like Comedy Central, Suffolk County. I mean, come, come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> oh, God. And then it goes to the town. The, the, the symbol of the East Hampton is, has the lighthouse on it. We'd love to, but honestly, we're just not capable. And then it goes to the octogenarian ladies at the Montauk Historical Society, bobbleheads. I guess we have to take it. We're a historical society, not even knowing where they're going. And look where we are right now. We have 105,000 visitors a year. We have NOAA Have the Oceans Institute right now, which is a program that's going to talk about the health of the oceans and, and the planet for future, get the kids involved. Um, we're, uh, 
we're most worthy, historical society, most worthy uh, owners of this place, and we have a lot of work to do. That's all I got to say. But that's it. So I appreciate you guys listening. And uh, <laughs> you, 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 you got it. You got to admit, of all the all the municipalities on Long Island, there's not too many storylines like this. I tell you that. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? What the hell are you doing next? <laughs> How can you top that? How much stuff did you lose yesterday? Nothing. Because uh, I've lived on my street 50 years now, and the waves from east to west yesterday were the largest faces. I ever saw. And I, call, I texted a friend in East Tampa and said, I got 15 foot faces in front of my house going this way. And later that evening, Channel 12 put a, a wave map up and put 19 next to Montauk. We had waves of 19 wow, right. at, at the shore, not somewhere offshore, somewhere. I mean, I've surfed 12 at Ditch Plains right back when in my youth. <laughs> 19 is another world. Yeah. Right. It's another world. Right. If you got through yesterday, God bless you. Because yesterday was serious stuff. And I that's maybe not three ties, but yeah. height. What's there? Height. They're breaking. Just well, that, that, I don't have conflict with surfers. Uh, they're the most underrated athletes in the world. I'll tell you that right now. Anybody who can dance on a 19-foot wave and, and just, just make it look like nothing, <laughs> they, 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 they belong, okay? Yeah. But um, oh, ex uh, I went down, and, and I was good enough to meet uh, Kim and Dave on the wall this morning, and um, yeah. I went down there with some police tape, thinking that these rocks that have separated from the lower slope, that this storm would pull them down, and then, then our recreation is, is a fallen rock zone. I have to be sensitive toward that. I have to know when to pull the plug on that before someone gets killed. Um, I was down there not too long ago, and there's a Hispanic kid looking for lures. He's looking for lures between the space between two rocks, and that's a 10-ton stone like this. I said, do you want to see your mom tonight? I said, you shouldn't be down there. He had no idea. So, you know, this, this chase right now with the 24 million and everything, we're this close. We have a water quality meeting <coughs> on the 14th of, of, of November, and then the colonel can sign this, and the agreements can be signed, and then it goes out the contract. So, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting around hoping and praying that we can get this thing through and, uh, and take it from there. Brian? This next phase starts where? Um, the next phase uh, starts, it's going to end someplace right about here. They have to integrate with the uh, town of East Hampton stuff that I did in 97, and it goes all the way around pretty much all the sides. It's, it's a thousand feet linear. Same height that's there now or higher? No, all different. Uh, bottom slope angle from toe, two to one slope. They had it three to one, which is better, but then I opened my big mouth and I'm saying, how am I going to do the maintenance with a 12 foot wide bench to lift 15 ton stones? I mean, are you going to invent a machine for me that's going to do that? No, you need a bigger bench. So it took them three weeks. I was amazed. They came back and they reduced that to two and a half to one, put a 20 foot bench at elevation 10 for fishermen and for maintenance. And then it goes up on a two to one slope to elevation 21 with a 20 foot bench and then goes up to 35. They're taking it up five feet further for the 73 year protection. So what's visible now would be invisible? That rock's being taken apart 80 feet at that time and reused. I see. They were going to build over this, but that doesn't make any sense. The rock is, most of it's good, just reuse it. So the new plan is basically to use this, basically the same wall but with bigger stones? Yes. Okay. Two courses of 15 ton stones coming from the toe. Okay. It's going out 43 feet. Comes out on a two to one. And it's right now, how far does that go out right now? Uh, well, that that's goes out into the 1946 work. That's that's the, the rocks in the sand. The, the, well, those 46 rocks are going to be covered up by a lot of stone above it. Okay. And the fishermen have to be told, get the hell out for two years. They don't like that. But on the end of it, they're going to have a world-class pedestal for their fishing. They'll be closer. They'll be safer. And uh, we hope the fishermen will be happy. Now, as far as the because uh, I don't understand, how does, will this affect the surf and break that they're worried about? Well, the work I did in 92, like I said, Alamo broke three times a year. Alamo didn't even have a name in the 80s, in the 70s. It had a name in the 80s because it broke three times. And surfers are clever with their names, okay? And uh, then all of a sudden, I, put, I did the work in 92, and all of a sudden, Alamo was breaking 18 times a year. So it's been put into the wave tank. The idea is that wave reflection is not going to be overbearing. You ask Aaron Chuchani, and he's the local coastal geologist. He said the same thing. Some of the surfers say, no, no, no. But 
they never really showed up with uh, anything substantial. So they were worried about back, back They were a little bit about wave reflection, yeah. yeah. Right. Wave reflection and coming in and affecting. But that's only going to happen like on the most gigantic days, right? And it yeah, might, it might, it might, it might, it right. might make it better for some for some swells. You know, it's all direction this way. The bottoms change all the time, so surf breaks change all the time. So yeah. it's not a, it's not a science where you can just push a button. But on, like on mediums, the smaller days, there won't be any. There won't right? be any. Right. From reach or rock. Right. And how long is the work supposed to take? Two years. Hardy hard hard on that. <laughs> I, I've worked out there in winter. Yeah. yeah and, 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 and the stones have to be set 43 out there. There's a toe stone right there. Oh. Would you please tell me how you're going to dance that program? Right. Okay. I've got some ideas, but it's, it's interesting. Very interesting. Okay. But no, once again, I said that some of this love interest and some of this passion has dripped off. Coastal contracts, low bidder, you're in. Come on, let's let's figure it out together. No need for low bid. Experience counts. So you're going to have some of the biggest com marine company companies in the world coming in and bidding this. You're not going to have a, a goofball like me coming in and say I, I can do that. Okay. So we're protected as far as that goes. Um, my parents, well, me and my sister out here in the late '60s and early '70s, and there was the article about Georgina Reed in dance paper. And I'm really glad you're doing this because what she did is so important and it's gone beyond the high tide mark. I retired from the State Department of Transportation and 15 years ago we had people coming and saying we can stabilize bridges, um, slopes on rivers and streams using vegetation and rock. And I don't know if there's a direct line from Georgina to Dave Rosberg and Dave Derrick, but when I heard that, it's like, of course you can. Georgina Reed wrote a whole book about it. So it's, right. it's really important work. I'm glad that you've not only been doing this to go to the future, but made sure we don't forget about it. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And, and, and what a wonderful opportunity, the luck quotient. There's a ghost here named Abigail. That girl is working. She's been working since the first time she met Georgina, okay? Said, get in there, Georgina, and do it. You, I, I, and the promotional. She didn't need any promotion. She just basically, get out of my way. All right, and then my word, the, my word of the highway, and that prevailed for a long, long time, and, and it worked for her. There's another thing. Um, this is like real vegetation trivia, but um, College of Environmental Science and Forestry up in Syracuse found a highly salt tolerant version of goldenrod along the Interstate 81 going south of Syracuse, and I don't know what kind you get down here, but it's very salty up in Onondaga County wondering if that would be invasive or if you could use that. My mailbox is 795 Montauk. You send me every rootstock you can and we'll make it work. I guarantee you. Way to go for bringing that in. Right. And how, why would it be salty up in central New York? That's curious. There's, there's just a lot of salt deposits there. They call okay. it Syracuse the Salt City. Right? I see. And okay. I mean, it's not like down here, but it's still. Right, it's, right. It's not in the air, but it's there. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, shore goldenrod is something that I like because when, when you dig it up, you look at that matrix of roots and you say, okay, I'm going to cut the top and I'm going to put you in another spot because I know what you're going to do. So the combination of plants has been a mystery. And, and Georgina was not a botanic person, so it was good that I came along to kind of just, you know, dapple here and there. Okay. Are you still going to have access to the North Bar and Camp Hero yes. while this is happening? You know, the, the Corps of Engineers said to me, so we're going to close it down for surfers for two years. And I said, yo, yo, yo. I said, you want nuclear winter? You're not going to close this thing down for any time. The surfers can na navigate. Let the surfers alone. Just put up some signs and some fencing. You'll be fine. Right. And uh, right. two weeks later, they, they said, okay, Gary, I, we, we, get, we catch your drift, okay? So, no, the surfers will be able, they won't be able to walk in the construction area and paddle to Alamo. They won't be able to paddle to here, walk in the construction. No, they'll have to. They'll have to paddle in from, you know, their, their spot over by, by where they enter the, the point break. Mm -hmm. And North Bar is sure. theirs. North Bar was working today. That's where they know was. Yeah. Sir? Greg, in the 60s, how come Bob Moses and Perry Dorier weren't part of the uh, solution? Because no one like Georgina had brought it to the light. It was, in, it was in a work in progress between that little political thing at Dan and then her patent years ago. And she didn't have a place to apply her patent, but on her own property, and she was Elvis in, in Rocky Point, you know. But that, that dance paper article got her out of Rocky Point and got her to the place where she was going to make something. So it was a science that was being learned, and it was just not the time. So this, this next project is supposed to last 73 years? 
Well, no, that's, that's not how the, the scientists look at it. Uh, it's 73-year storm protection. In other words, a 73-year storm, this protection would be no problem. All right? So you have 100-year storms. You have 500-year storms. You have 1,000-year storms. Okay? All those things come our way. We've only been testing weather for 150 years, so um, that will be up for grams. But once this gets built, there will be a maintenance uh, uh, quotient to it. So it's not as if one storm comes and obliterates 63,000 ton of stone. It may cause a hiccup here and a hiccup there. That's why that 20-foot ramp that I insist upon was important, because we'll get in and we'll fix that. And we'll, we'll live another day. We'll live to fight another day. And then, let's face it, Les Serkin, geologist, he wrote a book about the geology of Block Island. 2,000 years from now, Block Island's not going to be there. Okay? So whether you're talking geologic time or whether you're talking generational time, I'm talking generational time. We can keep this building here for 100 years without fail. With this new protection, if it goes in, let's go back to the recession rate, one foot a year. Mother Nature is going to have to take 63 tons of stone out, and then the recession rate starts again. You've got 80 or 100 years right there. Or maybe if climate's getting weird, you've got 50 years right there. So 100 years from now, I'll still be in the historical society, and I'll, I'll still be. <laughs> I, I got a big bloody mouth, and I ain't shut up, okay? So. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a storyline that should be shared. I thank you for coming. And it's a storyline that you can't write a script like this one, you know. You know, it's, 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 it's a hoot. So, thanks. Thank you.